So hello, um, we're going to talk about Salon, a new programming language here uh, from Red Hat. And um, let's start with... Uh, let's start with... <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> let's start with uh, who I am. Uh, I work for Red Hat uh, on the Salon project. I work mostly on the JVM uh, compiler and uh, Hurt module uh, repository. Hello, uh, my name is Stéphane Pardo, and I'm going to talk about Salon, a new programming language from Red Hat. Um, we're going to explain uh, quickly what Salon is about, uh, what the language is and what we're trying to do with it. And then we're going to talk about the ecosystem built around Salon and all the new projects that are coming up uh, uh, in Salon. And then we're going to talk about Salon's future. Um, so the first step is, um, is me. I work for Red Hat. Uh, I work mostly on the JVM compiler. We'll see later on that we also have a JavaScript compiler. I work on the Herd module repository as well, which is a, a really nice project where we have a module repo online for uh, Salon modules that I'll demo later on as well. Uh, also work on the SDK tools and integration between the various projects that I will uh, present later on. So I'm going to talk briefly about the language because uh, the language is, is not everything. It's, it's really the sum of all parts. Um, so the language is a new language, so it's meant to be powerful and, uh, and modern. It, it's meant to be a language that you can learn easily, um, that is readable and predictable. So it's made really for work in large teams where you can write something and then the next day you read your code and you remember what it does and it has to be intuitive the same way that Java is. Um, but it's more than that. It's also a whole ecosystem with a platform. Uh, modularity built uh, straight into the language from the start and uh, great tooling like an IDE and a great command line module repo, etc. I'll, I'll show this uh, later on. So briefly, what, what we can expect from the language is uh, the syntax is very inspired by Java and C Sharp. So if you're coming from Java or C Sharp, you should not be very surprised by what you see in the language. Uh, on top of that, we provide very powerful type inference, uh, more powerful type system, float typing, which I'll demo later on as well. Uh, of course, mixins and lambdas, comprehensions. Uh, we have interesting things like refi generics, which you don't get in, in uh, other languages. We have a module system, which is also pretty unique. Uh, great meta model that allows you to, to uh, inspect the modules that are running, which packages they have, query types based on annotations and everything. And uh, as I said earlier, we compile both to the Java virtual machine and to the JavaScript virtual machine. So you can run your Salon projects, uh, programs, uh, either on the browser or on the server, uh, even in, um, in Node.js and on the JVM. And of course, we have full interoperability with Java and JavaScript. Um, we also have a great IDE, uh, which uh, integrates with JDT, uh, which is the, the Java uh, IDE for Eclipse. So if you're familiar with the uh, Java IDE for Eclipse, you will have no problem using the Salon IDE for Eclipse. Um, we support lots of you know, quick fixes, refactorings, wizards, or whatever you expect um, from, from an IDE. Uh, and of course, the module system is uh, completely integrated in the IDE. So the IDE itself knows how to deal with dependencies, fetch them, publish them to a remote repository, etc. Um, so, in terms of you know, in terms of completeness of the IDE, it's it's definitely at least on par with the Java IDE for Eclipse, and in fact, we do have a lot more features than it has. So, it's something that is very very well done. We also have the start of an uh, IDE for IntelliJ, but uh, at the moment, it's uh, mostly con community driven. It's not complete yet, but you can already use it and contribute to it if you have uh, some features that are missing. So, I'll start with my first demo. So I'm going to show you. No, no, c'est bon, c'est bon. Uh, I'm going to show you a demo I did last year at the uh, Java Bowl for Java One, uh, which is an interesting demo. I'll, I'm going to show how you can write a client and a server in Salon, and the client is going to run on JavaScript in the browser, and the server is going to run on the JVM, 
I'm going to show in this demo how you communicate from both and how you can write uh, using the same language and how we deal with modules and interoperability with both JavaScript and the JVM. So I start with here. I have um, the server, which is um, defined in Salon. I have a module here uh, called server, version one. And I import a bunch of modules here. Um, the, the first ones, you can see they start with Salon dot something, and that's from the Salon SDK. Um, so we do, we do ship with an SDK, which is something that is very important when you want to support both the server and the, and the, and the, and the client. So if you compile to JavaScript and to the JVM. Um, you can see we import java.base, which is the jigsaw uh, name for, uh, for java.lang and, uh, and, and the Java collections and everything. Um, so you can import the JDK. And we also import uh, Postgres uh, database, which is a Maven module. So we have interrupt with Maven. Um, so in this project here, what we're going to do is that we're going to connect to a Postgres database, get the list of all the modules that we have in the, in the database, and send it over a WebSocket to the client. So the first thing we're going to do here is show, I have a get SQL function, which is a function at the top level. Uh, in Salon, you don't have to put functions inside classes. You can put them directly uh, inside packages, and they belong to the package. Um, so what I do here is I'm going to call the constructor of Postgres data source, which is something that comes from the, uh, the Maven module for the Postgres data source. So this is purely interrupt. You can see I'm not using new because we don't need to use new in, in Salon. Uh, we know that it looks like a function. You know, it's a function called a class in Salon is a function. You can invoke it and get a new instance back. Um, and here I use the value keyword, which is type inference. I'm not repeating the type. The type system is going to look on the right-hand side and see, okay, it's a Postgres data source. So I know the sources of type Postgres data source. You don't have to repeat everything. Um, it's also worth noting that this is very different from the Java 8 uh, type inference because we infer from what's on the right-hand side and not from what's on the left-hand side. Then I'm going to set a bunch of uh, Java Bean properties on this source. I'm going to set the server name, the database name, user password. You can see here that uh, we don't have Java Bean properties, which are a hack in the language that got added later on uh, to be able to abstract over virtual fields. Um, it, we, we implemented the same thing as in C Sharp, where you have, you know, there's no difference from the outside. Uh, between a field and a virtual field, something that is a method. So from the outside, everything looks like a field, and from the inside, whether you implement it as a field or as a, uh, an attribute or a virtual property, then it doesn't matter. Um, so I set these properties, and then I return a new instance of SQL, and I pass it a function, which is a, which is a function which takes no argument and returns a new connection every time. So this is very much like the definition of a function in Java 8 or in, in JavaScript. So I go to the main function here. Um, I am going to call my get SQL uh, function, which returns me a new instance of SQL, which is something defined in the, uh, in the SDK. Again, type inference here. And I'm going to create a new HTTP server, which is also something that comes from the SDK. This is a function from the uh, Salon SDK in Salon.net. And I'm going to create a new WebSocket endpoint here. And this is not magic. This is just a function call. And with curly braces, we can pass the parameters by name. So because in Salon, we support optional parameters, parameters with default values, you, you're, not you're not obliged to give them all in the, say, in the right order. And you're not obliged to give them all. You can pass only the ones that are required. And in this case, I'm going to call the WebSocket endpoint constructor with a path. If anything starts with WebSocket, then I'm going to register a callback, which is a function here, returning void and taking a WebSocket channel that will be called every time somebody opens a WebSocket. So whenever somebody is going to open a WebSocket, I'm going to call a read SQL function and pass it a callback. So what does the read SQL function do? It's right here. It takes a SQL object. It takes a callback of this type returns void, takes a, a name, a version, and downloads. You can see the, the declaration of the callback is very close to the declaration of, of a, a function, or even in C or in Java. I'm going to do something boring, which is I'm going to do some SQL to select a bunch of things. I get a list of rows, 
Again, type inference, this is of type results. And I'm going to iterate these rows. And here I don't have to repeat the type of row because of type inference. I'm going to look on the right hand side. I know that uh, results is a sequence of map to string to object. And so I don't have to repeat the type. Now I'm going to check that each um, row contains a name, a version, and a downloads, and that they are of the right type. They are string, string and integer, and not null. I'm going to, to check that they're not null. In Ceylon, whenever you see something of type string, or type integer, or SQL, then the type cannot be null. It's very different from Java. In Ceylon, if you want to express something that could be null, then you need to put a question mark at the end. And then it can be null, but then you can see that when you have something that can be null, you cannot pass it to something that accepts something that must not be null here. So this is built into the, the language that you cannot have null pointer exceptions. So for each row that I have in my database, I'm going to check that I have the proper columns, and I'm going to call my callback. So what is my callback going to do here? My callback is defined here. I'm going to create a JSON object with a name, version, and downloads. Here the arrow is, is uh, mainly a syntactic sugar to define a tuple of two. It's, it's like a map.entry in, in Java. So it maps from an, a string to an object. I'm going to create my JSON object here, and I'm going to print something on the, um, on the, on the console. So this is using double backtick, which is our syntax for string interpolation. And I'm going to send some text over the, the socket channel uh, the JSON is pretty printed, and then I'm going to sleep. So for each row I get in the database, I'm going to serialize it to JSON and send it to the client over the WebSocket. So let's run this before I forget to run it. Um, address already in use. Okay, that means it's already running here. There we go, let's kill it. Let's try running it again. Right. So let's go back now and let's go see what the client does. And first I'm going to show you the client in, in the browser here. So let's see what it does. What I'm going to do in the client is I'm going to have an HTML page with a button. And when I click the button, I'm going to open a connection to the server, a WebSocket. And then every time I get a new info on the WebSocket, I'm going to print the module that I got returned. So when you click, I'm going to print all the modules I get, I uh, see the number of downloads and the module and the version. So now let me show you how this is implemented. Here, I have a client module that imports the JSON module from the SDK. And this is where you notice that we can, in fact, use the same modules on the client and the server. So once you've learned how to use collections, the JSON module, and, and other interesting modules from the SDK in one language, then you can also reuse it on the client and the same module and the knowledge you have of these APIs, you can reuse it on the client. And let's see now how this does. So we've seen how we do interoperability with the JDK, with Maven modules and everything. Um, now with interop for JavaScript, it's a lot different because JavaScript is not a typed language. We cannot know at compile time whether things defined in JavaScript will exist or not. So in, in when you run on JavaScript, you can unplug the type checker and enter a dynamic block. When you're in the dynamic block, then everything that the compiler knows about, it will type check, it will help you, it will give you meaningful error messages if you mess up. But if there are things that it doesn't know about, it will let it through. And you will get an error at runtime as you would do if you were writing JavaScript if they are not available. So here, what we can do is we can call the WebSocket constructor, which is defined by the DOM. We can call jQuery, which is also defined by the jQuery library. And we can assign them into objects of dynamic type. A dynamic uh, variable is something which has no type that we know at compile time. So I create a WebSocket, I create a jQuery target, and then I register a callback on the on message. Every time I'm going to have a new message on the WebSocket, it's going to call this function. I create a function returning void taking a dynamic event. And here I'm going to get the data and I'm going to parse it as JSON. And parse JSON is something from the Ceylon SDK, which parses JSON. 
And you can see here that I do get a tooltip, I do get a, an, a message about what it is because the type checker actually knows what this is. And what is it? It is something that parses a string and returns a JSON value. Now what's interesting in Ceylon is that we have a, a type system that allows you to have more, more information than just the type system that you have in Java. We have something called union types, which is a bit similar to what you get in try uh, blocks in Java 7. Uh, where we can say we return something which could be a string, a boolean, integer, etc. Any of the value types that are valid in JSON and nothing else. You know, if, you if you had to do the same in Java and say, okay, what's a common supertype of all these things that you can have in JSON, you would end up with Java Lang object, which doesn't tell you anything. Here, we can tell you it's one of those. It's not going to be a SQL, for instance, or it's not going to be a, a, co a J component from AWT. Um, so you can reason about this. Um, so I'm going to assert. Assert is something that uh, verifies that you have something. You assume it's going to work, and it's going to define a new object in the rest of this block. So I'm going to make sure that it is indeed a JSON object and not a string. Uh, I'm going to get the keys here, name, version, downloads, and verify that I do get them of the right type. And then I'm going to call jQuery to create a div, and then set a few things in the div, and then append them. And, uh, and make them appear on the screen. You can see this is, this is definitely not more verbose than what you would do in JavaScript. And in fact, you have lots of pieces in there that are actually type safe that you are verified at compile time. So interop is, is actually pretty easy. And as, as far as boilerplate, let me show you the HTML. Let's go back to here. Uh, the source code for this is, is fairly standard. We have you know, just a title, a bunch of CSS. I include jQuery because I'm going to use it in the demo. Uh, I include require.js, which is the module system we compile to in JavaScript. Um, this is pretty standard. Lots of modules are defined for require.js. I configure require.js, tell it that my modules are located here, like the SDK. Um, and I'm going to register a callback on jQuery. So when the document is ready, I'm going to call require.js to load this module. And when the module is ready, then I'm going to get a reference to my button. And when it's clicked, I'm going to call the run method that I showed you just earlier written in Ceylon on the client module. So you know, there's really not much boilerplate and then a bit of HTML. So let's go back to here, um, I mentioned the SDK already. Um, it's, it's worth noting that uh, because Ceylon is a modular language from the start, the SDK is important, but the only thing that we ship with the Ceylon distribution is not the SDK. We don't ship the SDK. We ship only the language module. The language module is, is uh, briefly the equivalent of java.lang, which contains the bare minimum that you need to run a program. So it contains types like string, boolean, etc. Uh, it's worth noting that we don't have primitive types in Ceylon. Uh, we have basic types like these, but they're not, they're sitting inside the type system. They're not like int and float in Java, which are special and don't fit in the rules of generics and everything. Um, behind the scenes, naturally, we're also compiling things to primitives on the JVM to have good performance, but you don't have to see this. We have interfaces for set, list, and map because we use them in, the, in, the, in our stream API. But we don't have any implementation of them, of the collections in the, in the language module. Uh, we have a few interfaces to define what happens to operators because we support uh, operator overloading for a, a, a limited subset of operators. So you cannot define any new pope operator, but you can redefine the operator of uh, square brackets for correspondence, for instance, to get the value of a map or a JSON object. Um, we have callable, which is the type of every uh, lambda. Uh, and then some information like get the language module, which version of the backend is running, and the meta model, which is uh, the equivalent of Java reflection, except it's a lot more powerful because you can uh, iterate all the modules that are loaded, uh, which packages they have, which types they have, uh, which is something that you can't do in Java unless you use external libraries and scan the class path and jar files, etc. And the SDK is a side, which means that we can release new version of the SDK between releases of Ceylon. So we release a new version of Ceylon, and then during the month, the year after, we can still keep on pushing new versions of the collections, of the, the file API, logging, whatever. 
and, and all these modules can keep on coming afterwards, which is very, very friendly, very useful. Um, the language module, however, has to come with the uh, distribution. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the meaningful part of having an SDK is that uh, if we only told you to use the JDK, then you couldn't be able to use it on both JavaScript and the JVM. By providing an SDK that is cross-platform, then you are able to use the same thing on the client and the server. Um, let's talk about the command line a bit, because the uh, command line, uh, I've shown you the IDE, but the, uh, the IDE is not all the time you spend. Very often we end up in the command line trying to compile something or um, and, and we have a really great command line. We took example on Git, so we have only one command called Salon, uh, which means that you can discover every new command. So you type Salon and then Salon dash dash help, it will tell you all the subcommands that you get. You get one command for compiling, one command for doing the documentation, etc. Um, we support plugins as well, as we will see later on, and naturally we have completion as well in the command line, so you can discover everything and help, etc. Let me show you quickly what we can do with the command line. Here. So here if I type salon and I complete, I get the list of the, uh, the uh, subcommands that I get, the same as you would get with git. And I, uh, well, I know that you know if I type salon compile, I'm going to be able to compile something. If I type salon run, I'm going to be able to run something. Um, you get great help as well. Let me show you a new demo here that I have. Uh, also using JSON, what I'm going to do here is I have another module where I'm going to say hello Java 1 and then I'm going to get a URI that points to GitHub API and I'm going to get all the list of the uh, repositories we have in the Salon organization, uh, parse it as a JSON array and then iterate the array, make sure I have a uh, JSON object, a name, open issue. I'm going to print the name of every uh, repository we have on GitHub and print the number of open issues. So let's go back to the command line. What I need to do here is compile and then the name of the module. Uh, if I don't put the name of the module, Salon Compile is going to compile every module there, but you know, which is also useful, but um, but here it no which, hold on, I forgot the name of my module here. Uh, Ferry Devux 2014, that's one. So I compile this module, and then I can run it. So you can see it says hello. Oh, I get the same problem as yesterday that I get a problem reading from. Uh, apparently, I don't have a good internet connection, so I cannot show you here. But the idea that you you should note is that you know the tools reason in terms of modules and not anymore on class files and Java files and source files. So you say I want to compile this module, I want to run this module. You don't have to deal with the you know the name of the the class you want to run, etc. Let's go back here. Right. Uh, let me show you a bit about the, uh, the community that we have and the ecosystem we have around Salon. So we have something that got started by a member of the community, which is Salon Build, uh, which is a build system for Salon written in Salon. And um, you know, it's something that is pretty logical. If you, if you are able to write uh, Salon code on the server, Salon code on the client, then it also makes sense to reuse the same language and the same SDK you know uh, to write code in Salon uh, for your build. So let's show how this is uh, working. Um, here. So I have here another, uh, the build module, you know, which by convention is the, the build module a version we don't care. Uh, I import the engine, which is uh, the thing that is going to define all the annotations I need to, to define my, my goals. And I import a set of tasks, which uh, the, the Salon task will allow me to compile Salon programs and run Salon programs. This is what it looks like here. I have my, uh, I have a top level uh, attribute, mod, that I can reuse in all, all my tasks. And I have a goal here, which is an annotation that says, this is a goal, this is something that I can call from the command line. 
you can see we don't have the add sign for annotations in Salon, so, um, so we don't need to put this. I have a compile goal where I'm going to print something to the console, and then I'm going to call the compile method on the Salon uh, test that I imported from, from the build. I'm going to compile this. Let's go back to here. So when I do Salon build, it's going to tell me the list of goals that it sees. It sees compile, publish. So I'm going to call the compile go. It's worth noting that the, uh, when we ship the distribution, we don't have the build uh, plugin in the distribution. This is something that you can install later on. If you do Salon plugin install build, it will fetch the build module from the repo and it will install it locally as a special uh, plugin. So, um, so you can see I've been able to compile my thing. All right. Um, now let's show something a bit more interesting by introducing another piece of the puzzle. Where is it? Here. Which is Herd. Uh, Herd is the module repository we have for being able to publish uh, modules online and being able to fetch modules online. It's something that's meant as, as pretty and usable as GitHub. Uh, we have REST APIs, which the uh, command line and the, ID and the IDE are using to integrate with it. Um, we support staging repositories where you will publish your module and we will check them before you publish them, uh, uh, before they are made visible to everyone. And uh, of course, there's integration with, uh, with uh, everything that's meaningful. And let me show you a demo of this. Sitting here. So I have a, uh, a version of Herd running here. It's a web application that is uh, a, a GPL, so you can use it. We use it online. This is where we store the SDK and uh, we make everything available for you. But you can also install it locally in, uh, in your enterprise, uh, make it private, make it public, whatever. We have this tool and it's meant to be used. Uh, so you can browse things by category. For instance, we have the SDK here. You can see which versions of the modules. You can see uh, if they're available for the JVM, for JavaScript can see past versions, you can follow them as uh, RSS feeds, see who is working on what, you know, what is uh, Emmanuel working on, what is uh, Hibernate uh, version uh, supported this month, etc. You can uh, browse the documentation directly from here as well. It's something very, very nice. So I'm going to show you how we publish something here. I'm going to create a new upload, which is a staging repository. And it tells me my upload is sitting here at this URL, so it also tells me the commands that I need to run to be able to compile directly to this repository. Um, uh, gives me, if I want to use ants, you know, they, it, it, it's really trying to help you publish to it very uh, easily. So I'm going to show you why it's then meaningful to have a build system that is written in a programming language and not just in XML where you can't really have a defined logic in there. When you publish something to Herd, Every time you'll get a different URL if you have a, a new uh, staging repository because you can have more than one staging repo. And so it's meaningful to have an interactive process. When you want to publish something to Herd, the build is going to ask you, okay, where do you want to publish it? Which user are you going to use, etc.? And then I'm going to use this information and directly invoke the compiler to publish directly to this repo and, and generate documentation directly to this repo. Let's go back here. If I do build, publish, it's going to ask me the repo. So I type in the repo. I type in my username. The most secure password on internet. Um, it's going to compile directly to this repo and document directly to this repo. So let's go back to... Uh, heard here, right, if I reload, then it's going to see, okay, it sees the module that I have, it tells me I have an error because I already published this, this version, you know, it does a bunch of checks, like uh, are the, the, the dependencies already present and available, etc. Um, and uh, well, I have an error here, I should bump the version number because I already published it. If I bump this, then I can publish it. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to show you something else quickly. Um, 
Kyla is also another piece of the uh, of the uh, ecosystem that is written by uh, Julien Viette. Consists in a number of parts. So we have a Promise module for Salon for the SDK, which is an implementation of the uh, A plus uh, Promise uh, specification. Uh, we have interaction uh, uh, bindings for Vertex 2 and 3. So Vertex is um, no JS equivalent, but written uh, for the JVM uh, that is uh, part of, Re of JBoss Red Hat. Um, so you can write verticals in Salon, you can integrate with the Vertex uh, asynchronous uh, clients in, in Salon, etc. And we have Kyla, which is both a web framework and a model view, view model controller. So that's uh, something uh, very interesting. Unfortunately, I don't have time to demo it here. Um, talking about the future a bit, uh, we released version one of Salon last year, um, which is uh, the, the first release that was uh, production ready. We are going to release uh, version 1.1 uh, at the end of this week. Um, we increased uh, the, the, the speed of compilation quite a lot. We fixed uh, over a thousand uh, bugs in this, uh, in this release, so it's, it's a lot stronger, a lot more user-friendly as well. We polished uh, a lot of the edges in the language and in the tools. Um, but there are very few changes in the language. This is very much a, a minor release as, as far as features are concerned. Uh, but we did improve uh, interop in, in Java and JavaScript quite a lot. We'll, we will have version 1.2 in 2015 with lots of new features in the language. Uh, serialization as well, which uh, might actually make it before 1.2, uh, which is something that allows you to send objects directly from the JavaScript VM to the Java VM. Um, and then uh, catching up with uh, Java 8 features, like uh, in terms of implementation, actually, because in terms of features, we support everything. But in terms of, of speed, we don't compile to Java 8 by car at the moment. Um, that's it. Thanks for attending. And if you have any questions, be free to answer them. Any questions?